ladies and gentlemen, coming up right now is our knowledge series, and it puts the spotlight on world-class leasing at your fingertips. To give us the benefit of his tremendous experience and knowledge on the subject, we have Mr. Kelvin Ng, CEO and founder of Synergistic Real Estate. He was a founding member of Ascots and successfully developed many firsts in malls in Asia, including China, Vietnam, and Taiwan. He was the first to introduce wireless concepts for the real estate and hospitality industry in Asia. Kelvin and his team have done over 10 million square meters of consultancy work. These include 40 malls, 15 mixed-use properties, and 35 service apartments. To share his vast experience on world-class leasing techniques at your fingertips, please welcome Mr. Kelvin Ng. I'm going to share a bit about my experience, both from Singapore, Southeast Asia, China, Middle East, a bit of the US, and what I have done over the last 25 years in retail and mixed use. I work with uh, local developers uh, from one to become the projects to become 20 projects. Uh, and then I was with uh, Capitaland, a head of retail before. And uh, I left and then uh, built my own uh, asset management retail consultancy company. And uh, over the years, uh, I've seen success, I've seen failure, but I've learned from everybody. So I'm going to share with you about uh, this important topic about leasing from a strategic point of view. All right? How to make sure that you don't have empty malls or if you are a developer who, uh, who have uh, empty malls or going to buy an empty mall, what can you do? Uh, I've done 10 of them all right, uh, over the last 10 years. And uh, I'm going to share with you some of the uh, examples, including some uh, poor performing malls. How do you improve? Right? And these are real case examples with numbers. And also, if you are do a, doing a small mall, all right, can you be successful? You have to be the big ones, not necessary. And most important, India has a huge market and we are just at the beginning. If you look at India, China, each of these countries can build a few thousand malls, not a few hundred. I just make a count with the ICSC, they have 120,000 shopping centers over 80 years. So a few thousand is not a lot. But the problem is we don't have quality malls. I was in a Credit Suisse meeting in uh, 2014. There are 3,000 investors there. And I, I talked on, about online, offline, and shopping malls is in an oversupply in China. And I concluded, I said, you guys are still here because you know that Asia is booming urbanization, consumption, middle class. You are still here because you are looking for investment. And yes, they are all looking for investment. But the problem is that there is lack of quality projects. So it becomes a so-called a problem for uh, many developers who are inexperienced, they turn from residential to retail, or they do mixed use, and uh, they cannot get the returns. If you have a good return, all right, you can get the investors. In fact, many of the projects that I do are only at the planning and the leasing stage, and the funds come in. Not even at the completion stage. Some of them, of course, is strategic. The funds come together with the developers, which I'm going to share some of the examples. So I think developers can grow from one to... 25 to 30 to 100. Capital Land started with only beginning, all right? but they acquired a few companies, all right? and then they have now 100 over in the last uh, 15 years. Simon Property started much earlier, and they have four to 500, including 100 factory outlets. I'm very fortunate to work with Simon as, their, as the chief consultant when he comes to Asia and China, and I'll share with you some examples. And most important, there's a process to get it right. China's largest developer is the name, by the name of Mr. Huang Jianling. You may have heard of his name. He's the richest man in China. He built his first nine malls non-successfully. And uh, we were in the same conference in 2005. And he's, he tell the meeting his, his pain, his painful experience. He says, if you don't have money, don't do retail because you need to, you need to, uh, you need to have money. All right, you, need to, you cannot just sell the shops and then, uh, and then make money out of that because he made that mistake selling the shops 
all right? And then leasing to all the anchors for a song. And the first nine, first nine projects, he has to demolish two of them. Subsequently, he got it right. Now he has about close to 100 shopping centers, in the, only in 10 years, right? <clears throat> we look at process, how to get it right. And then how to be effective. We talk about some examples. I'm going to share with you a real case examples in Malaysia. If you're in Malaysia, you know there's a twin tower, right? Twin tower. And opposite the twin tower, there was a mall. Looked like an office building. We turned that around two years ago. It was emptied for seven and a half years. Right? And going forward, some best practices for some of you who are building new malls. How to make it profitable? Right? I've done many malls as early as 1985. When I jump into one of the largest mixed use, if you're in Singapore before, you know where is the Oriental Mandarin, the Pan Pacific, the Mandarin Singapore. I did that project. I was a head of operations, promoted all the way, and I was head of operations for seven and a half years. Right? I have tremendous experience learning from many people. The best architects, my, my boss employed the best architect, the best hotel operator, etc., etc. And I learned and absorbed as a young lad. <coughs> We are facing tremendous problems now in any city, any country because of uh, the uh, competition. Whether you are local, foreigner, whether you are Indian developer, you are facing new, development, new developers coming to the country. At the same time, you are facing competition from the local. At the same time, we are in this era of the online retail. Right? At the same time, with oversupply. Some cities have oversupply and you have Retailers have many choices. Why do they go to your mall? If you are empty malls, worse. Is this, is, this the, is this the true statement? Not necessary. I show you how the empty mall, you can still attract retailers. So we are in this situation of too, much, too many choices for the shoppers, too many choices for the tenants. All right? Then how do we get it right? How do you attract the shoppers and the tenants? Um, about three months ago, I was in a conference in Singapore, Sentosa. And one of the Capital N staff, uh, who I've never met, he heard about me and he asked me, Mr. Ng, how can I improve rental? We went into REITs, 2001, 2002. But then rental is not moving. Now it's very tough to bring 6% yield. My answer is very simple. If you can bring more and more effective shoppers to the mall, you deserve the rental. If the landlord cannot bring more and more effective shoppers, people who buy, then you don't deserve the rental. You cannot increase the rent. Are you doing enough marketing work to bring the effective shoppers to the mall? <clears throat> there will still be a big demand driver in Asia because we will be you know, uh, driving 60% of the world economy in the next 15, 20 years, especially with urbanization, smart cities and all that. And now 70% of the world shopping centers are in Asia. I just talked to Amitabh and said that we invite India to join the Council of Asian Shopping Centers, <clears throat> which has now has about 10 countries. So the first thing about effective leasing is you must have an effective development strategy. What are you building? Be very clear. What are you building? Try not to do almost everything. When I met the largest developer, GTC, from Israel, he came to uh, China. He said, Kevin, I don't understand Tier 1 city. It's too expensive land. So he straight away go to second steel city only. And he built successfully, and he made money. <clears throat> and he left uh, for some reason, meaning company strategy. <clears throat> so what type of mall are you building? Be very focused so that your resources can be channeled and multiplied because you are in a big country. You can do 100 community malls. Dealing with empty malls. This is a case uh, about a few years ago in Shanghai. Right? Uh, one of my ex-staff, he joined a boutique fund. He was, used to be my marketing director and he, he has a German boutique fund. And he saw this building, he said, this is uh, emptied for five years. What can we do about it? I said, let's work together. <coughs> so it was in a very prime location in a Sichuan Beilu, one of the old commercial streets in Shanghai. <clears throat> All right? And uh, used to be a most popular street before the Nanjing Lu that you saw earlier on the first speaker. All right? But over time, it has deteriorated. And this was at the corner, the red one is a corner at the junction there. 
So we saw this building, and then it was like that on the left side, you know, on the left. And then uh, this was the after on the right. It was turn around. And this was the final building that we get, and it's fully leased. All right, the, and then it has to go through a rebranding because the name was, uh, you know, uh, people have forgotten the name. Uh, Beam have a bad image and reputation, so we rebrand and give a new name. Uh, and uh, this was the old building, it was, you know, done like this. And uh, interior, given it landscape, color, the, the details, I won't go into it. But the whole strategy was that the government wanted somebody to come in. All right, and give it a new breath of life, improve the street image because it was an eyesore for five years there. So we worked together with a fund and then together with a project manager and turned around. So the asset took us about two and a half years, all right, plus opening time, uh, whole building completed two years. So the asset value improved 60%, just on one property. We went on to do another project that is a public listed company. They're too shy to put the asset into the books. So the, the CEO talked to me and said, let's do something about it. And it was second round and third round. <clears throat> the biggest, one of the biggest uh, service I did in China was on the second tier city when, uh, when Simon Property and Morgan Stanley were looking at building 50 malls. All right? And, uh, and then uh, we worked together because... I, I told Simon, you are the biggest in the world, but you don't understand what is vertical malls because in the US, it's only three-story, two-story, one-story, big car parks. Right? In India, China, we go vertical. And land is expensive. You can't do the same format. Say, can vertical mall works? I say, yes. I show him one called Raffle City, Shanghai. It's six, seven-story. And its rent started at 200 renminbi per meter square. Within seven years, I move it to 1,002. It was five times the asset value, and he was shocked that this is opportunity, and he decided that he should take China. And, and we, we did uh, five projects for him, five projects for him, all on second tier city, anchored by uh, Walmart. So this is the experience with the Simon Group. I, I have great, great experience because uh, they, they were really uh, very clear on strategy, very clear on design, no fanciful uh, materials, uh, focus a lot on good layout, right positioning, all right? because they understand the business. They are the biggest in the world. And uh, one very good uh, case study on the leasing was that uh, in one of the projects, Changshu, which is the second to third tier city, he asked me this question and said, that, uh, where do we put Walmart? I say I like Walmart and I don't like Walmart because they don't build the rent. They pay only, in, in renminbi, is $30 renminbi per meter square. If you divide by six, that is about only uh, $5 US per meter square. So I say you either go to the basement or you go to the fourth floor. Because in China, below, below grade, you don't have plot ratio. right? So it's like free. And then the fourth floor is the lowest rent. So I say let's put it on the fourth floor. I say, will Walmart go to the fourth floor? I say, he will. And this is a classical example of uh, planning with the end in mind. That means that what is your investment cost, what is your development cost, your construction cost, add up together, land cost, and what kind of rent are you getting? If you've done your calculation right from the very beginning, you should be getting a good wheel. The trouble is many people either speculated, do not do the calculation, do not do the numbers correctly, all right, so we work out the numbers and say that if I put them on the fourth floor, you get better yield. They, would they go? I say, yes, we do a good laid out. We do not have big department stores as anchors. We are very early to start the Zara, H&M, Sephora, and all the fast fashion in China. So we bring all these mini anchors, we call them, all right, to sack up the anchor space with the cinema, with the, with the uh, Walmart. And instead of giving Walmart 12,000 meters square, which is what is their requirement, I give him two levels of 6,000 meters square. On the third floor and the fourth floor, I split them. Instead of giving one floor, I split them into two layers. And then outside Walmart will be retail space, 
outside the third floor will be retail space on the third and floor. So I have, I have, have shops, they have to pass through the retail space before they go to Walmart. And I have vertical parking so that you could, you could do your loading even on the fourth floor and the third floor. So I solved the problem, I gave them a good sign. So at the end of the day, this was the first Walmart that get into the fourth floor. So it's all about good space planning, good financial numbers, good layout, making sure that it is a win-win solution. Another case in point, it is one of the uh, second to third tier city in the south. This was a 450,000 mixed use. It's the first of its kind in, that, in the city and uh, nobody has done this project. One of my Malaysian friends, he, he got a land there and, and uh, he showed me his layout. I said, this layout is bad. Let's redo it. So I brought uh, one of the architects into this job and then uh, we, we did our first mixed-use development in this provincial capital, about 20 million people. And uh, there were no mega malls at that time. And we were something like five kilometers from the uh, city area in a bare land with no retail facilities and the housing was just beginning to build. But I remember when I built Marina Centre, it was the same scenario. It was four kilometers from Orchard Road. There was reclaimed land. There was tree was just planting. There were no buses there. But I say the concept was right. We have to do it big from the main city. So we do 1.3 million square feet. We do the first five-star hotel in Nanning. There was no five-star hotel in this second, third tier city. And then uh, the owner, Malaysian owner, contributed the land. We got a local developer and SRE, my company, we helped them from research, planning, leasing to operations. So this was the 85% uh, lease. So what I share with you, the last few examples, sometimes you can be effective not just with yourself, but you can effective by combining funds, developers, and management together. The uh, case of uh, uh, Morgan and us and Simon and Capital Land, this case study alone, plus CITIC, which is provide the land for, right, makes 30 malls in five years in China. So it's about how do you co collaborate and cooperate, right? speak to market, because as, as a team, you have, you have speed to market, each one has its own resources. There's co-branding. It's easy for me to talk to Walmart if I am Simon Property. Right? And of course, Walmart, if he knows that you have an experienced mall manager, he will take some risks. And you aggregate the resources with the funding of Morgan Stanley, you have no other problems you should make money. So, investor, developer, and manager, each has its own role, all right? From land banking, capital management, access to capital, and exit. That ensures that you can roll out after the first one. Create a model and roll out. I started in a company that, given after Marina Center, with only one asset. And that one asset is a mixed use. Within six and a half years, we roll out 25 properties. 13 were managed by us as third party manager. We weren't that rich then. And then the other half was a joint, all through joint venture. And when we joint venture, we found the best in the city. We joint venture with Jiputra. We joint venture with Banyan Tree in Thailand. And be, before long, six and a half years, we have 25 properties. And it was a listed company. It attracted the attention of the market. And then we merged together, I was become part of Capital Land. And I continue in Capital Land to build the portfolio. But of course, every country has its own story to tell, and uh, every developer has its own strength and weaknesses. There's no perfect model. I just sharing you some model that has proven to work. And, uh, and it's very important that the roles are clear. All right? Whose role is to do research? Whose role is to do uh, exit funding? All right? whose role is to do management. It must be very clear so that there's no duplication of work, all right? There's collaboration. <clears throat> so when you put all this thing together in terms of leasing strategy, all right, the tenants know that you are building a particular type of mall, a, a regional center or a community mall or a super regional center, all right? The tenants know that you are doing five, 20, 50. I use to speak to Uniqlo, I just do a test case. I say, 
Uniqlo, will you go to Third Tier City? He said, maybe. I said, what about if I do 50? Ah, he said, yes. So it's about strategy, right? I brought many of these uh, developers from Singapore. I work, my team and myself, we work with a few thousand uh, retailers. Many of them were never been into China. Like, you know, if you heard about Bread Talk, they were born in my shopping centers, all right, in 1993. When, and the food, food junction is, you went to Singapore, it's very nice, all right, uh, and uh, Republic, uh, Food Republic. They were all born in the centers there. And actually, they start from one. And then they moved them over to, uh, to uh, uh, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, China. So when you have a strategy, all right, you have one, your center. What is your central experience? Who are you targeting? What is the culture? Do you have your own unique service culture, identity? Or there are certain features in the mall that is unique to you? One look at it, you know. What is it that you differentiate yourself, your center from all other centers? Right? I, I visited uh, India a couple of years back, five, seven years back, and I wrote an article for Images, and I told you that I saw there's going to be a lot of empty malls and problematic malls. There was an article on empty malls. If you, some of you remember, <coughs> I saw the problem. Yesterday, I came back, and I, in the evening, I went to see a few malls in Mumbai, around this area. My conclusion is that there's still a lot of room for improvement. In terms of space planning, storefront concept, in terms of uh, 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 opportunities to improve traffic and rental. So I think this market is still very, very attractive. <clears throat> and then when you aggregate the other component on the left, the blue side, you have the business partners. You know, then you have a brand synergy that you can move and grow the market. So essentially, the developer play a very critical role in terms of getting the land, working with the government, and getting the connections, which is very essential in any new markets. I started mall in Taiwan in the first mall in Vietnam in 1995, when there was no shopping malls. And it was in 1995, at the same time I did the first mall in China in 1995. This was already into the reach already. Right? So, local know-how, good mall management company, investors, all right, and then create a pipeline, which is the fourth step. And then work with the tenants on a long-term basis. They will go where you go. And your leasing and marketing costs becomes lower and lower as you move that agenda. They know what you are doing. They have more faith. They will pay you even sometimes a premium. Right? They know that you will make a difference. You are there to help them. So what about smaller shopping centers? Right? Can you survive? Yes. With the onslaught of internet, can you survive? Yes. <clears throat> I use this graph called the life cycle. Right? We, we learn it in marketing, right? life cycle. So as the mall grows, it gets dated sometimes. And then you have to think about how to produce the S-curve instead of the inverted U. Right? So this, this, this was the first suburban mall uh, that came out in Singapore, one of the earliest in 1993. Uh, I was the director of this company, and uh, we tender for the first suburban mall. At that time, people was worried whether can this work. I look at the demographics: about 300 to 100,000 to 500,000 going to have a subway line on top of it. There's only one shopping centers around that area, and uh, the cashment is good. All right, so we found a contractor, all right, do design and build because we want to. Open the first suburban mall in 18 months, fully leased in 18 months, 100% leased. All right? We were already in the shopping center business, so the, the partner liked us because we can bring the tenants. So we brought in, our, uh, it was open in 93, it's only 25,000 meters squared. All right? 100, 100 shops, about 400 car parks. All right? So 
because we do design and build, 18 months we complete, we save 10 million. We open six months ahead of time. And uh, this mall has achieved 6 to 7% yield for the last almost 20 years. All right? And it was the first batch to put into the Real Estate Investment Trust in Singapore in uh, 2002. First batch of real estate to get into the trust. The rental has since moved from 16 million now to 50 million. So it is a very small mall in a suburban area. But what we have done was that when we were planning it, we, we, were, we knew that this catchment would grow. We provide opportunities for small little phase two and four little space three. All right, to add on the space gradually as the market grows so that you don't have uh, you know, uh, empty space. All right? We start small. All right? And uh, we, we were able to bring in new tenants to an area that they never been before because we, they were our tenants before. They know what we are doing. And this project makes money from day one. I remember we paid 20 million Sing Singapore dollars to DBS on the year one. All right? And we were able to even collect marketing fees from the tenants. The tenants willingly pay because we have 40,000 on a weekday, 60,000 on a weekend, people. Even today, you have time, go and see Junction 8 when you are next in Singapore. It's still bustling after 20 years. I will now go through the whole process. What does it take when you have a problematic mall or a uh, mall that you need to reposition? This was the case I mentioned opposite KL's uh, Twin Towers called Avenue K. Right? Avenue K was built some 10 years ago uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, left empty, 90% empty. Although there was a subway and that was actually what attracted me again. I saw there's a subway there. I said, how can it go wrong? But he said, Mr. Ng, very dangerous. Many 15 people have seen this project. Some of them have tried, but they have failed. I say I can't feel when there's a subway and you're on top of the sub of the uh, of the uh, uh, when you're on top of the subway and you have a good cashman. I say something wrong with the way you do the mall. So I went in, I saw the layout, and I have first meeting is management. Talk to the management, find out what are their concerns. Actually, they run it themselves before, and uh, we also interview some industry experts. In fact, I was introduced by the. Uh, by the president of the Shopping Centre Association, a close friend of mine, he said, take a look at this one. This is very, very challenging. And uh, we analysed the footfall, we analysed the trade mix, only the basement was operational, the upper floor were all closed. And then we do the segmentation, we conducted 1,000 consumer studies, and then uh, we do tenants studies, talk to the tenants. I went to the Asian Asia Pacific retailers conference. I talked to three retailers who had 60 brands. I said, I'm coming back to do Malaysia. They say, which one? And they say, this is Avenue K. They say, it's a good location. Give a shot. And then after that, I get my leasing director to do further research with the retailers. But the most important thing was the a very systematic way that we do the research that produce the final result, which I'm going to share with you a bit more in detail. And then we do the competitive study. Very detailed, every competitor, what are they doing, what brands they have, who is their target customers. And then we get into the final part is that we come up with possible options, possible, uh, and what are the implications for management in terms of commitment to renovate the, the, the mall. And the fourth stage, the interior design, then go into trade mix analysis, the yield, the rental projections, and finally, the marketing communication. How do we launch it? All right, this is the whole process in three phases. <clears throat> and uh, the, to very quickly, I run through this. When we do the intercept studies, we, we really, really take this very seriously. The questionnaire design is most important. All right? and most people forgotten now. Let's go back to the first principle. What do the customer want? What facilities is needed? You know, is it bigger car park? Is it bigger toilets? Is it wireless? Is it handphone charging? Is it diapers changing? We ask them one by one. Right? We've also found out what the competitor lack in terms of facilities. What are they poor in? What are they no good at? Maybe they don't have enough lift and escalators, cargo, uh, traffic jam problem and all that. We found out everything about the competitor. All right? And what did the customer want? Then we do some benchmarking. All right? We have our own uh, uh, analysis of benchmarking the competitors. 
then we do this so-called uh, brand strength comparison in terms of quality and size. All right? What is the brand equity? It means the future at this given point. What is the brand equity we created? All right? Brand equity means that when you lease your company, all right, beside your asset, you can also get money from your equity that you build up. That's like a name, the logo and the brand that you created. Just like Coca-Cola brand equity is probably bigger than its, its own asset itself. So uh, we do this whole thing, all right, and, and then all this is a view of looking at the output, the margins that you're going to get, right? And uh, this I'm going to go through very fast because most of you are experienced people, how to differentiate a mall, how to have core attractions, how to give the experience, the graphics which uh, you all understood. We're not going to go into detail. But let me share a bit about more intimate part of it, which is the Cashman study. All right? The Cashman in every project is different. No project is the same. No shopping mall is the same because the Cashman is always different. The land shape is different. All right? The architect helps you to draw, but you must know what position are you taking. What is your market segment? Primary, secondary Cashman, tertiary Cashman. If you understand that, then you need to know how does it get to the city or from city to city or from country to city. The Mall of America attracts people from Japan and Asia. People fly in. They have tertiary Cashman. It's a tourism mall. They attract 40 million people. Dubai Mall attracts 60 million people. Its population is only 1.5 million. Right? So it's about how do you define your Cashman? How do they get there? Do you have the transport to bring them there? Do they walk there? So if you're a community mall, the 20 minutes is so important, the 10 minutes is so important. If you don't understand them, you cannot do their business. All right? So we went through this exercise, 20 minutes drive, who are they? All the malls, 30 of them. All right? Then tenant mix by categories, 50 minutes time zone. Look at all the categories, cinema to food, departmental store, and what is lacking. What is lacking? Look at the vacancies. All right? 10 minutes drive, 10 minutes from the center, the tenant mix, all right? Uh, again, look at uh, what is lacking, all right? And then the 10 to, finish, 10, to finish, 10 to 15 minutes drive, all right? So every five minutes, we can see opportunities. And then we know also what is lacking. From the consumer survey, all right, we confirm the opportunities. So one of the key opportunities we saw was that there were many officers around there. Then the young, the young adults, the executive, is a niche market that we saw, which KLCC being a high-end mall is not serving them very well. So I saw there's a gap. So what we did is that uh, we create the interior, we create the, uh, the, the, the whole uh, signage and edit to fit my customer's profile. You see, when people say I do a family mall, family with young children, one age, age one to seven, and seven to 15 is different. It's not just a big connotation, family uh, uh, with children. You have to define what age group because this is the tenants you're going to bring them education, all right? play centers, etc. It's not for a generic, the teenagers don't go this place anymore. They play with computers, they play with their laptop. Right. So it's very important that what are you going to do in the interiors to fit this bunch of people that you are going to attract? Who will come on the weekday? Morning, afternoon, evening. Weekend, morning, afternoon, evening. Holidays, morning, who is going to come to the mall? If you can answer that question, you are ready to go. Right. Then we look at the tenant's profile. Shop lot sizing, very important. No wastage. Many more started with deep shops, big shops. They have to give a discount to the tenant. So the yields start wrong from the very beginning. All right? I've seen, I've corrected 40, 50 of such projects. Some of them are world class. All right? So be very careful with the shop sizing. The size of corridor, the size of your atrium, too big is wasting aircon. Height on every floor is very important. Right? I've done the, uh, if you go to Malaysia, Penang, I've done Gurney Plaza. I brought my son to see Gurney Plaza. I said, this was done by me 15 years ago. And, and I was very surprised that 
a big mega mall open next to it, and the, my, the traffic is still the best in the whole of Penang after 15 years. After 15 years. Four years ago, I went to Taiwan. I built the first mall in 98. Today, it's still striving, and now 100% owned by GIC. Right? 15 years ago. Marina Centre is already 20 over years, and it's still striving. So, how do we make sure it's strive? It's to make sure that, you know, beside the tenant mix, all right, the interior, the space, you don't have to change. In other words, vertical transportation, the lift to lift distance, escalator to escalator distance, void. Void is different from atrium, right? Void is the inter, inter, uh, intervisibility within floors. Third floor can see the fourth floor. Second floor can see the first floor, the shops, names. When you can see, you go. You cannot see, you don't go there. All these space requirements, loading, unloading, traffic, uh, circulation, you don't change them. You only change the retailers. All right? The mall has no big capital expenditure. All the projects I show you, all right, after it's corrected or from beginning, we don't change the layout. We just improve the tenant mix, and the management and the marketing to bring the yield up. I've done this for 20 over years. I've never failed in one single mall. These principles. All right? So it's very important that the planning team, operations team, are right in front, not behind after you take over the mall. All right? You must be right in front. And if you don't have the right people, get the right people to do it for you. Because this is the most important part. The layout and the design, you don't change it anymore. All right? You only do it after a major retrofitting 10 years, 15 years down the line. Maybe because it's some reason it's obsolete. But the height, you can't change it. If it's clear, 3.8 meters clear or 4 meters on level 1, you can't change it. All right? You can't change it. So these are fixed. All right? You try to fix it. So if you are clever, you build with the end in mind, which is the mall will last for 30 years. So every 3 years, I have opportunity to improve my rent. I, I, don't much, I don't have much capital cost. I, keep, I select good materials. I conserve my energy well. My operating cost is kept down. I don't have, I don't have expensive marble to polish. I don't have uh, uh, bronze to polish every day. I say bronze because I used to have one mall that had one kilometer of bronze to polish every night. I remove them after that. After three... After one year, I give up on that. All right? So, we improved the layout. The uh, net area improved 14%. So, I told them that no problem. I told the owners, we can get the bank finance. All right? We'll get you the bank finance. All right? And the uh, atrium design. So, end of the day, rental moved up 20%. And then uh, net leasable 14%. The asset value we yet to tell, but I think by easily now, it has moved out asset value easily now, 30-40% by now. Right? Eventually, it will exceed 60-70% if the owners choose to exit. Right? So, uh, we, we got the biggest, uh, uh, end of the day, we have the biggest uh, second, Asia's second largest h and m store in Malaysia and uh, cotton on. All right? So, the facade was changed from a conventional building. <clears throat> so, one of the key success factors in leasing is always get the right position correct. Make sure that you understand who is the customers. Because bear in mind that the retailers have lots of options. You say you are the best, the best location. Actually, they know because in order to open five stores, they probably see 25, 30 stores. So they know which developer is. It's a, has a good layout, has a good design, who has a good positioning, has a good management team. They know. They know. They know better than us. Their network is very, very small. The retailer's network is very small. Right? So it's very important that uh, you prepare yourself adequately before you start talking to them. Right? We resisted talking to H&M even after eight months, nine months. We didn't talk to them. We were looking at demographics, you're looking at opportunities. And when we do the research study, we ask the consumer, if I were to do fast fashion, I have H&M, Zara, CNA, I have all these tenants, which one will you choose? And they all choose, 80% choose H&M. 
I brought this to H&M. I say, this is from the customer's survey. They want you to be here. All right? And not only that, we hope that you can do the largest in Malaysia. So we use this research work to do the, the marketing work all right? and to do the leasing work. So the direction and strategy is very important. All right? Look at the process. Look at your structure. Who are you going to complement or work together with? All right? And then the, how do you stay competitive and sustainable? All right? It's very important that you create a design that is sustainable. All right, a design that is sustainable it means that beside all the good green features, the layout, you don't make changes. I, I personally see that uh, most of the uh, vertical transportation in India is still quite weak. Vertical transportation. The placement of leaves and escalators at the right location, the distance is still by trial and error. Right? This is something I see very obviously. The environment, there's a lot of opportunity. You talk about experience, the environment can be improved further. Right? And then, uh, uh, so these are opportunities to do better than your existing competitor. And of course, also it's very important to look at funding. All right? So a whole simple process is that you, know, uh, you, need, you need all kinds of expertise from positioning to ongoing operations. All right? But most people just hired the architect, the landscape designer, the engineer, and they start building. In fact, what is important is the first part here. You need to get the position correct, bring the operations team back to the front. If you don't have, hire somebody who has done successfully many shopping centers to help you do a design brief. The design brief sets the tone for the whole financials, marketability, and functionality. What malls are you building? How many story? What is the trade mix? What is the financials? What are the rent growth opportunities for every floor, 5 years, 10 years, 15 years down the line, what do I do after 10 years? When you have this plan, then you go to the architect and say that, okay, I have this budget, all right? I want creative, but I have this budget. I want to do something, no marble, no expensive material. I want creative. We pay for the design, but we want this. This is for a middle market family mall, a community mall, all right? I have no time, but I'll share with you one example. I, I did one interesting project in, uh, in, uh, in Putong, Shanghai. Putong, Shanghai has 150 shopping malls by now, over 20 million people. It's overbuilt. Right? So uh, one of the largest developers is the Shangri-La Group. They have two malls, one in the city center and another one in the suburb. So they found that it's very risky. So they passed us to us, and uh, we built one of the best community lifestyle malls in Asia. Right? called Kerry Parkside. If you, some of you are familiar, go and visit Kerry Parkside. The ambiance, the interior, right, the plaza is very pleasing. The expatriate love this place. And, and, uh, and uh, I just found out that Shanghai has 180,000 expatriates now. So at that time, we were looking at the expat market. But expat market drive people who travel overseas, people who have experienced the, the, the convenience of a good quality malls, a lifestyle mall. Right? So it's important that you have a complementary uh, team to help you. And uh, this complementary team includes uh, financial resources, uh, consultants, all right, so that you can stay competitive, even though you are first time. All right? Even you are first time. I, I, I just quote one very simply one case. One of the best mixed-use development in Beijing was built by a developer that did it only the first time, and he got it first time right. Right? If, you, if you don't know where is it, there's only one Ritz Carlton and JW Marriott together, two hotels. Right? And that has the highest turnover per square feet of retail space with a mall and residential. They did it the first time. Right? Did it right the first time. Okay, so how to do it right the first time? Start with the end in mind. Financially viable. This was about that. We do it for money. Right? Of course, we also do it to make sure that it's leasable. The tenants pay the rent. And most important thing, the whole environment is, is friendly, sustainable, is functional, so that you don't have to change the mall again and again. All right? So if you are building a mall the first time, all right, one of the key things is the development costs and the operating costs. All right? I show you some important figures. When you are building a mall and the construction time is normally design process, it's always two and a half years. All right? 
the uh, green line the green line shows you information you lack information all right you don't know what are the potential problems and the uh, the blue line shows you blue line shows you the first cause it means that your capital cost the orange line shows you the running cost all right so when you are doing planning and schematic all right and design development you lack information and if you do lack information by the time you you build you can't lease a space but if you have the right information from the beginning and you have the principle that uh, I must manage my development costs and your operating costs in the first six months when you are doing your conceptual design and your schematic then you are you are controlling your future operating costs and this is very important because the future operating costs over 50 years the operating cost is 75% of your total cost which means that your Operating your, 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 your construction costs and your design is only about 25% approximately. Over 50 years, your operating cost takes over. So back to the graph again, it's very important that first one, six months to one year, all right, while you're doing the design planning, you manage investment costs and operating costs. Then you will be planning a mall that's going to make money. All right, if you miss out on the escalator or put the escalator on the wrong place in the case of avenue k i didn't add any new escalator i think the escalator direction was wrong i just dismantle it turn it around the traffic move in in another case uh, i saw that the entrance wasn't visible but next to the this and this next to the side of the mall there was a department store and my mall was so so small it's only twenty thousand meters square but the road between my mall and the neighborhood, which is a bigger project, is only 20, 25 meters. So I open a side entrance, and the tenants and the shoppers from, from the side just walk into the mall. It's because 25 meters is a walkable distance. 100 meters is not a walkable distance. 25 is a walkable distance. So I just open a side door, and the traffic just move in from the other side. Because it's visible now, and it's 25 meters, they'll look for something else there. So, staying relevant is very important. As a management of shopping centers, you have to continue to stay relevant, look at the design, look at the services, continue to look at how to use creative marketing. Right? Creative marketing doesn't mean that it's expensive marketing. Right? How to work with sponsors, that they will come and pay you the the sponsor fee every year because they love the shoppers that you have in the mall, right? And then uh, how to embrace technology, right? Technology is so important. In 1999, I was the first to introduce broadband and wireless technology to Asia because I was doing dial up from the hotels, you know, and always got jammed when you call the, call the hotel line, it's always got jammed. So I, I went, I was still with Capital N, I talked to my, my colleagues, I said, let's do do something good for the real estate industry. We built software, we built uh, broadband with one of the uh, company called Aztec, and then we, we start to e-enable 80% of the hotel rooms in Singapore. Within nine months, we e-enable almost all the hotels, go to Risk Carlton and do the first wireless internet. And ever since, it's more than 15 years. How many hotels, um, sorry, how many malls today are wireless? Yesterday, I tried at the airport. When I came in, I tried at, the, at the, uh, uh, some of the malls. Most of them reject foreign handphones. I don't know why. Wireless internet. So this is, and again, a gap that I saw, all right? I, I, that I experienced that, uh, you know, even in the airport, I don't know why a foreign handphone cannot, cannot engage, all right? So experience, I, I think afternoon there's going to be a session on that. I'm not going to talk a bit about that. But I think the experience in general, I just mentioned something is that, uh, it must cater towards different profile of a customers. If you are serving the executive, the mall, color, the toilet may be all different. If you, have, if you are serving the luxury customers, the toilet is another different type of toilet. Very simple. The ladies like to be able to do makeup. The lighting must be enough to do your makeup. If you are carrying a bag that is, that is $5,000, you must make sure that the vanity is not wet, you have proper hooks to keep the bags. To keep the, bags. the smell of the toilet should be rose smell, not urine smell. All right? This is a luxury toilet. 
There should be plants that should be so far there if you are doing the luxury mall. All right? But how many malls take care of their customers this way? Convert to experience. All right? The curve of the, of the driveway to the mall, the, curve, the curvature, is it easy to drive in and drive out? Do you have technology that I can find my car in a very short while? Uh, I have luggages to carry. Who is helping me? If you are a luxury mall, there should be concierge to help you carry all these things. Then if you are a family mall, what are the facilities that will cater for the family mall? All right? All this will be different. Uh, I think there's uh, much opportunities for collaboration, you know, and as far as uh, Asia is concerned, even India, uh, more and more uh, projects, uh, they are looking for uh, uh, partnership, right, uh, and uh, semi-completed buildings and so forth, all right, and the risk management is to look for people that can complement your own resources. And uh, as I mentioned to you, that when you plan the mall, plan with an end in mind, the whole product life cycle, so that you don't stay obsolete. All right? uh, there are malls that in the US, they are around for 50, 60 years. They look as good as brand new. All right? All right? In Singapore, most of the malls are built in the 80s, but they look as good as brand new. And maintain it so that your operating cost is kept down. Make sure that materials selected are correct. The building is intelligent enough to monitor you know, uh, now with, uh, with the technology, you can monitor all your assets. So uh, just a very quick uh, uh, brief on my company. We have worked with many uh, international uh, developers from uh, GIC to Maple Tree, Morgan Stanley, Simon, Tesco, uh, Express Flexit Land, and uh, many of these are also, some of them are local uh, developers from uh, Southeast Asia and China insurance company. All right. We have also worked with uh, some of the uh, clients that I mentioned to you before in the presentation. And uh, basically, SRE, we are development consultant and asset manager. Uh, we, we are total, total solution from research, not project management. Development consultancy is complementary to the developer's resources, even including helping to source the right architect for the job. Research work, we do our own in-house research and uh, we have our own software to analyze. And then we also plan exit for the owners so that you're looking for uh, partners or funding. We plan and exit who will, who will possibly buy community malls, who are likely to buy uh, tourism malls and all that. So we, 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 we work with these funds very closely so that you know, when you build a mall, you have an end in mind, you know who is going to be your future buyers or exit uh, partners. Right? So the, with that in mind, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, uh, any, we have any time questions? for a couple of questions. We, have, questions. we do have time, yes. Yeah, please. Thank if you. If you have any question, please. All right. Any, anyone has any question? If you do have a question, please raise your hand. We'll have a microphone passed to you. Anyone? Hi. Uh, audible? It's on, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you had mentioned about the only basically about the offline projects. I can't hear you, sorry. Uh, you have okay, already, only explained about the offline project. Have you experienced somewhere where online has impacted somewhere, centers in China, Singapore, through your experience? Can you highlight something on that? How you have tackled that problem? Oh, the impact of online, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, I give you my own uh, uh, analysis. I, uh, I presented recently very glaring data to uh, uh, a very big audience. Uh, I use the China examples because uh, online in China has reached 10% of the total retail sales. And uh, I think the biggest now is the UK, they exceeded 10%. But I, I reveal a lot of uh, statistics to, to more to, edu to inform, I wouldn't use the word educate, my, my fellow retailers and friends in the uh, development business. Uh, Amazon.com is in business for 20 years, right? in the online business, they are the biggest and the one the earliest. Do you know what is the net profit of Amazon.com? How many of you knows can share with that? The net profit of Amazon.com spread over 20 years is 0 0.38. 0 0.38, less than 1%. Last year, they lost money, right? Online has its three functions, which is uh, convenience, wide selection, and low price, right? 
uh, people who shop online, uh, I think online is, is not going to change. It has provided the convenience, it has provided the niche, uh, and uh, it will continue to be there. Uh, in China, they have about uh, almost more than 1 million, uh, no, more than 10 million uh, online retailers, all right? Almost 10 million of all kinds. I explained to them that China is a factory of the world. It's easy for any, any, any young graduate to start an online business. But I also warn them that the success rate is not high. When I started the uh, broadband internet business, many of my retailers look for me and say, why do we do an online portal? I say, it's too early. And in China alone, I don't know the figures for India, but it's good that you can do your own comparison. Every day, 10,000 online retailers drop out. So at its peak was in 07 and 08, all right? Uh, online was at the peak, but today, every day there's 10,000 online retailers that drop out. 80% of them do not make money. The 5 to 10% make money. And the 10%, they are still there to hang around, right? Hoping to make money. Online has its purpose. In fact, I give one, 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 one excellent example. Nostrum started the shoe business, right? So they were starting with their best departmental store now in the US. But when they aggregate an online to go offline, they have one, one online retailers that produce shoes that is uh, according to the shopper's needs. It means the color, the material, all right? the shape of the shoe, the, the, the shopper can go online and select. And, and then uh, they, they customize the shoe for you, even put your own name. It means that you build your own shoe. They were profitable from the beginning. So when Nostrum looked for online partners, they used this tenant because they, these online tenants can go to Nostrum and select the material and test the material and fill the material and, and test the shoe, I rather. Right? So I think this is a kind of complementary success that eventually I will see that, in fact, if you know Google, Amazon, they're all good looking for shops, right? Eventually, it has to be on both sides. In fact, somebody has studied that if you are a good offline retailer, you have a better chance, higher chance than even an offline retailer in terms of success rate because you already know the, the customers, right? You already know the customers. Somebody has done that study. And I think if you look at it in general, Macy has proven that they can do online and make money. They create brands, you know, that is a private label to Macy's, and they have proven that. I'm sure you have read a lot about their story. And there are many, many more case examples, right? So I see that this is a complementary role because we have smartphone today, it's convenient. But again, I have seen uh, people that have embraced technology, they have done wireless in the mall, they have integrated uh, solution within a mall that when you come into the mall, if you, if you last week you buy an Apple, uh, lapt, uh, Apple uh, uh, iPad, the moment you are in a the mall, they track you and they tell you that I'm selling accessories today at 50% discount and they entice you to go into the mall. There are people who have used this and improved the mall performance between 5 to 10% of sales. Right? So they embrace technology and I think eventually it's going to be an omni-channel thing. That's how I see the whole picture. All right? But I think uh, the scary part is that people think that online is going to take over the mall. No, I, I don't think so. All right? Many of the cities in China, all right, uh, the business is down because of the uh, uh, luxury mall having problem with the, uh, the, you know, China has a lot of officials, corrupt officials that used to buy luxury goods. That has come down. But the total sales of retail has not come down. It's still growing at 8%. However, the shoppers are distributed to more shopping centers than 10 years ago. So they have less traffic. Doesn't mean that the online retailers are eating up the business. They have taken over some business, like the, uh, 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 it's easy to do online if you are in the uh, travel business, the books business, the uh, electronic business. There is a category. I don't have the, the chart here. I have, a, I have a category that shows all the various categories 
where some of them having a store is no more important. You can do it online. There are certain categories that online has championed and did very well, right? But there are certain categories they have not done. Uh, it's difficult for them to, uh, uh, like groceries, it's very difficult for them to be totally able to replace. They have a complementary role, but when you buy your vegetables and your fish, you still want to feel and see it, or your oranges, right? So I think they have a role to play, but I'm not going to, I, my view is that it's not going to, as long as you continue to understand who your customers and stay relevant with them, they have smartphone, how do you interact with their smartphone, stay relevant with technology to make it shopping more and more convenient. Thank you.